organization had issued in their interim guidance on published on April 22, 2020, which stated that the risk of transmission of COVID-19 virus from the feces of an infected person appears to be low. There is current evidence that suggests the COVID-19 virus may be excreted in feces, and there are several studies have detected COVID-19 RNA fragments in fecal matter of patients. In terms of water, while the presence of COVID-19 virus in untreated drinking water is possible, it has not been detected in drinking water supplies. Uh, the risk is expected to be low, and this is based on data from previous outbreaks of related coronaviruses, such as this is like SARS a couple of years back, um, and then there was the Middle East Respiratory uh, syndrome. So it's based on these really um, that you know there is they're saying there's the possibility, but the risk is low. With they're still doing research on the COVID nineteen virus itself to understand the characteristics such as viability, survival time, migration patterns, transmission pathways, and activation by conventional disinfection practices. And I guess as the research goes on, uh, WHO and CDC would public, publish information and then we'll be able to update uh, further. Uh, based on the previous uh, outbreaks of related coronavirus, um, current disinfection practices uh, had proved sufficient um, in controlling the virus. Right, and then I was saying that um, IWA has done um, some studies in on combined disinfection because if you're using disinfection as your only mean, well, chlorine disinfection as the only means of disinfection, you can't exactly discharge water with a very high residue because this will have environmental uh, impacts. So what they would have done is that they would have uh, used higher ozone or UV doses uh, in the initial disinfection stages, and then they would have added chlorine for the final disinfection, but they added sufficient chlorine um, just for that disinfection and to maintain the residual. So you're not exactly going discharging with a higher residual chlorine. And what they found was that the combined disinfection practice achieved a 99.99% inactivation of fecal coliform. So the fecal coliform in their disinfected effluent was uh, below two CFUs per liter, and the residual chlorine of the effluent was less than 0.1 milligram per liter. And they're saying based on their study, no COVID-19 was detected after disinfection. So just from that or those studies, um, there is the potential for the use of multiple disinfection technologies to provide a wastewater treatment with greater reliability, robustness, and flexibility. And this is only because our treated wastewater is what is discharged into the environment and, um, you know, by some way finds itself back into the waterways and then this becomes the water that we treat for portable water. At this time, WHO and CDC has stated that the standard practices associated with water and wastewater plant operations uh, should be sufficient to protect our uh, wastewater workers. And these include the current engineering and administrative controls, hygiene precautions, specific safe work practices, and personal protective equipment. And I believe there's a separate session to deal with um, you know, these controls and precautions. And again, the recommendation right now is based on the historical data for uh, previous uh, related coronavirus outbreaks. And then as more information comes to hand on the COVID-19, um, they'll continue to update. So at this time, the CDC and WHO does not recommend any additional COVID-19 specific protections for workers involved in wastewater management. 
um, because there's a possibility of risk um, is really where we need to focus on our disinfection techniques, uh, procedures, making sure that these are efficient, uh, effective and efficient. So here we've identified some of the control points or potential risk and um, you know, the areas where the distress is likely to uh, pop up and then possible responses to these. Um, just that so we are prepared because there is a possibility of the, the virus being in our wastewater or water. And for wastewater treatment, there's the open basins and the potential there would be with aerosols that is generated uh, within the treatment process. And the response would be, um, you know, that we are aware of the, the risk, there's proper signage, our operators have the PPE and they are aware of the potential for transmission and then precautionary sanitary practices. In terms of disinfection, infectious coronaviruses persisting in domestic uh, sewage. And this is where, again, we have to ensure that the chemical disinfection or whichever means of disinfection we're using are effective um, in terms of drinking water treatments. Again, it's the infectious coronaviruses in water supplies impacted by wastewater effluent. So the effluent is being discharged from wastewater treatment plants. You have to make sure that that is not discharging viruses back into the environment and then this um, discharge makes it way into the water way. And then this is the same water that we are gonna um, you know, treat to use for drinking. So here you ensure that there's continuous monitoring and performance of your drinking water disinfection processes, especially for systems with upstream uh, wastewater impacts during af and after your outbreak. In, in terms of, um, and, and just a little summary here of how we deal with the PPE that would have been used to protect um, you know, our wastewater or water operators. And WHO recommends that the utility gloves or the heavy injuries or plastic aprons are cleaned with soap and water and then decontaminated with 0.5% sodium hypochlorite. Uh, this is every time it's used. Um, sodium hypochlorite is essentially household bleach, um, which is something uh, we would all have access to. Single-use gloves uh, made of nitrile or latex and gown should be discarded as infectious waste after each use and not reuse. And hand hygiene should be performed after your PPE is removed. So this goes back to um, hand washing techniques. And really this is what um, brings us to the end of um, my discussion on you know, the impacts of disinfection on our water systems and then how does this really lead to the COVID-19 outbreak and then precautions that we can take to ensure that our operators are, you know, safe. So that's it there for me. Thank you. Devinka, uh, apparently your, your slide's stuck on five. They didn't move at all. It didn't move? No. Okay. So if you could just maybe just refresh them a bit. So while anybody may have some questions, I know we had some technical glitches. Okay, so five. I was seeing well, six. What probably you should do is to go to... Um, yes. to Can I probably to, email these slides across? Slide the probably to, um, slideshow. Are you seeing slide yeah, six? Right now, so it has changed, yeah. So no, you, it has changed, uh, so it didn't change before. No. Okay. All right, so we have, after slide five, this is really um, what we talked about, the areas where the risk could pop up, the potential risk, and then the responses, and then just the safe handling of the PPE that the operators are using. So in terms of, well, uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions for Devika at this stage. Do you have any questions or comments or ex some of your ex own experiences during the COVID crisis with wastewater treatment that you want to share? Devika, 
You can raise your hand if you want to speak so I can unmute you. Or you can write your question in the chat. Uh, what, let me ask Devika, were there any challenges, for example, um, I was at another session today and, you know, there was a question of now that everyone has um, the, the face mask and the type of material they're made of, were there any special issues with, in terms of disposal and whether they were able, would have affected um, sewage treatment in any way? Uh, no, so the face mask um, should be really treated as, um, so that will fall into the class of the single-use nitrile or latex gloves, and they should be uh, discarded as infectious waste. So really the mask um, should not be entering the wastewater treatment um, system itself, because uh, and I'm not sure whether um, the macerators or you know, the pre-treatment in um, some of our wastewater treatment facilities, whether it would be able to um, you know, deal with this type of solid waste. Um, okay, so we have um, Christian Simon has a question. Yeah. Go Hi, good evening. My, um, my, I wasn't really going to ask a question. I was just going to share my experience of dealing with the wastewater treatment right now through the whole COVID-19 um, pandemic. Sure, go ahead. Um, well, I primarily work at or work for the Ministry of Health in Trinidad and Tobago. And some of the sites where we were previously using as for regular um, maintenance work, we have now converted them to step down facilities for coronavirus patients um, who have begun to enter back the country. Um, and what we have started to do and what they have mandated us to start to do now is to do more of our regular effluent testing. So we have to take even more precautions um, as to when we go onto the site, when you get onto the site, when you leave any site or, or whatever, while you're working on site, you know your restrictions as to make sure where all your PPE you know, make sure and stay in, in, in designated areas. And as I said, we, we are right now being mandated to take a lot more regular. We used to do um, F1 testing once a quarter, um, and now they have moved it up to once a month. And probably as this, what they said is that based on the influx or the more persons coming into the country, this may have to be increased based on the amount of people and from whatever destination persons are coming. Yeah, they, they would want to increase testing because they have to, um, you know, they're saying it's not detected yet, but they have to make sure that that is not entering the uh, wastewater treatment system. And if it is that, um, you know, the disinfection techniques or whatever treatment techniques the sector have that it's capable of inactivating the, the virus. So I would assume Correct. that is why they would have, um, you know, sort of increased the effluent testing. Yeah, um, basically what now they're asking is that previously, you know, whatever the effluent or the fecal coliform um, possible or um, EMA set limit for discharge into whatever water course or whatever, if it was probably 50, now they're asking you to make sure that, you know, the treatment plant is working probably at optimal levels where, you know, where people probably, you know, would have slacked and taken, a, you know, a backslide. You have to make sure it is down to even half of whatever it was previously and monitor that, you know, and right now they're actually thinking about doing a secondary form of disinfection because in Trinidad, we don't really do secondary um, disinfection in Trinidad. Yeah. So, if, if they said there with testing in terms of testing your fecal, um, feel free to reach out to us at Kaiman. If you have a need for testing, um, we'll definitely be uh, willing to assist with the effluent testing and monitoring of your fecal coliform levels and in your effluent. So um, if that is something that 
you know, the plans require, feel free to reach out to us. We would definitely be able to uh, provide support in that area. There's, okay, there's, thanks. There's a question here from Junior Austri. Um, I, can un, I can unmute you, um, Junior. And so you can ask the question yourself. Go ahead. Okay, I'm not hearing from him. I don't know if he's still there. But the question was, um, should the COVID-19 quarantine area have its separate on-site treatment or should it be connected to the sewer network? In Dominica, only primary treatment is done. Can you comment in reference to COVID-19? Um, in terms of a separate treatment, um, again, that would have to be guided by WHO and um, CDC. And then that involves a whole lot of extra costs. Um, like they would have said um, from previous outbreaks, um, there have not been any issues with the uh, wastewater from hospitals or even, um, you know, uh, domestic uh, wastewater from households that would have had infected patients. Um, there wasn't any uh, real risk to the uh, wastewater treatment system. So I, as they continue their research and continue to public and publish information, I guess that is what will um, guide us there in terms of how we uh, move forward in terms of the treatment. In terms of primary treatment alone in Dominica, so you just, yeah, so there, uh, and again, the monitoring at the end of your primary treatment um, is probably what will be critical here. So if you're only doing primary treatment, are you disinfecting after primary treatment? No disinfection. So um, is does the primary treatment then meet your affluent discharge criteria in your country? Sorry, Timothy Augustus has a question. Uh, go ahead. You're unmuted, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Um, I just it's, got back in. Oh, I saw your hand up, so I thought you had a question. Sorry. Okay. okay. All right. Um, Austri, I think um, the Vika was asking something. I, I missed it about whether it's something to do with the treatment. Could you repeat the Vika? Yeah, so the question there, because she said there's no disinfection, and the question here would, um, you know, is the primary treatment alone without disinfection meeting the uh, affluent discharge criteria in Dominica? Um, I don't know if his mic is working. But I'm not hearing, he's not, there's no feedback from him. Anyone else has any other comments or questions that they wish to pose? Yes, um, that's, go ahead. Hello? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah afternoon or. Um, uh, probably a quick comment and um, and a, a, a question probably posed in one. Well, we do wastewater in the private sector more so primarily in the oil and gas. And uh, so they took really proactive steps because they have um, uh, ex our nationals coming from, you know, through the ports, you know, through their loading boats and that kind of stuff. So they had discussions beforehand, let's just say January, February, and these are the questions 
uh, that was posed and they began to put uh, procedures in place, had the contractors have do business continuity plans concerning these things. Also, the, uh, what should say, the expectation of health and safety, health and safety, it was a little bit higher. So with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the, the PPE required, it was a little bit extra. And so they have us with stutter staff um, using K95s, N95s, um, ensuring that, uh, you know, we, as we go on to the industry or even onto the plant, they do temperature checks, um, make sure that we have masks and that kind of thing. So the question is, uh, even also what uh, the standard with the mask. I know certain plants, they have N95s, they have KN95s, and they also have multi-layered uh, face coverings. So the question for Divika, is there anything as far as safety-wise or the standard concerning the standard? Um, I know it's widely um, publicized or widely, um, yeah, I should say publicized that, you know, N95s and that kind of stuff for uh, maximum protection up to a certain point. But would the, the multi-layer face coverings be sufficient um, uh, as, as, as study suggests? Divika, are you around? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Divika. Yeah, the guidance that we are getting is stating that the, um, you know, face masks, um, you know, it's a precautionary measure because um, they, the way the virus is spread really is through um, respiratory droplets. So in terms of, so, so that is where the social distancing and your hygiene practices come in. In terms of the contact with the wastewater or with water, it, it really would be, um, you know, whatever is remaining in that water. So this is here where we sort of have um, the control because the, the water really is majorly what really comes in contact uh, you know, more like our hands and probably just like the clothes that we wear. But um, in terms of droplets from wastewater, um, so I think that the mask, um, you know, it offers some protection in terms of whether it's sufficient or not. I, I mean, it's really not our place to exactly comment as far as the authorities have said and they would have advised. So in Trinidad, um, you really have to wear a mask if you're going out. You actually right. cannot um, go to do any sort of business without wearing a mask. It has become mandatory for the wearing of masks. Okay. Any, any other questions? I don't see anybody's hand up. If you have, you can feel free to put On your hand side up. On a side note, though, if um, masks are needed, again, Kaizen has K95 masks on sale. So again, you can uh, reach out to us at 299-0009. Uh, if anybody needs a mask, uh, interested in purchasing a sure. mask, Oh, one one other comment, uh, Devika, uh, seen from Kaizen. I think I know that you um, are responsible for doing um, water analysis or analyses for a couple industrial plants in the oil and gas. You should probably um, <laughs> pitch for doing a more frequent um, uh, water analysis, especially for wastewater, because um, we service a plant that uh, Kaizen actually does the wastewater plant for, and they do it like every quarter. And um, so I think I think seeing uh, with this sit current situation, I think um, it's at least you know it's 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 more feasible and um, you know it'd be it it'd be for for the, in the long run it'd be better that you know probably pitch for more frequent water analyses. Agreed. <laughs> um, <laughs> but really, that is sort of um, you know here or there. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, uh, we normally will not 
um, say how often you have to, this is normally dictated by EMA, foot back or whoever the authorities are, would right. normally tell the operators how often they need to monitor. So that really is, um, you know, how we know when to monitor. If the particular organization has within their HSE policies or their HSE plan and they would, uh, you know, want to monitor more frequently, um, right. you know, we are there to give this service, but um, we don't exactly um, provide the monitoring schedule. This is normally dictated by EME and um, the industrialized, well, normally like the ETEC parks or foot right. right. Um, but in terms of okay. testing, if anybody requires any sort of testing, uh, waste disposal, if you have uh, medical waste, if you have your gloves, your mask, uh, coveralls, things that you need to dispose of, um, again, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we provide those services and somebody would uh, you know, get back to you, go through the process with you and provide whatever assistance we could uh, uh, provide in that area. Okay, do you have any other questions for our presenter? Um, I don't have any myself, or if you want to share any other of your own experiences, I think that's a good forum that we can do things like that, hence the reason for starting up that series of webinar, our series of webinars, and we hope to take on some other subjects. As we go on, the other thing we would like to know from you is about the um, the time, if if it is convenient. We we tried this uh, Tuesday afternoon at, at about four, between four and five. We know um, a lot of operators sometimes that's when they probably it was they don't they can't really be in webinars in the early part of the day, so. I would just like to know if you can, if you don't want to comment now, you can always send us some feedback via email and let us know your thoughts or through WhatsApp. But we, we want to continue this on a weekly basis. We have um, some other topics. We're going to get some other speakers. And it also gives you, some of you, an opportunity to make presentations um, to your peers and share some of your own experiences um, during COVID and other routine things that that you do in the field. So um, we have topics to deal with. Um, this time we were doing disinfection and wastewater treatment in the fight against COVID. We want to look at water chemistry and chemical dosing that could be useful for some of our people taking the ABC examinations wastewater treatment, operations, maintenance, and wastewater treatment, safe handling of chlorine gas, occupational safety for water operators, you know, things all to do with PPE safety, confined spaces, workplace safety, um, fundamentals of pumps, uh, maintenance of pumps, um, what water laboratory, um, monitoring and control of water quality during COVID and, and particularly during this drought. So we want to take on some topics around the drought. Some of what some of our utility operators are doing to help in um, making sure that everybody gets a little water during this severe drought that is being faced throughout most of the Caribbean. Um, managing water distribution during the drought and also with COVID um, because we need to have water. Um, preparedness, we're moving, we're now into June and that's the hurricane season. We have to do some preparedness for that um, and to sharpen our skills to be well prepared. Um, communication skills, you know, in the processes. So we have some people who are into communications in the water sectors and we hope to bring them on so to interact with everyone. Um, you know, a lot of you get into um, preventative maintenance and so on and and emergency communications as again we getting into the drought so these are just some of the topics and we want to keep it going um, we 
we'll keep you informed as we progress and um, hope that you found this session to be useful. Well, it seems I'm not hearing anyone again, so I don't know if you have left. Yes, please. Yes, I, I found it um, quite um, useful, quite interesting, the lecture today. Um, it is a pity that we, at, at least for Trinidad, we, we have to depend on the, the EME and so on to, to police that effluent quality and so on because they have developed the standards. Right. Um, with this particular pandemic, I think it would now shed some, or it should increase our government's awareness that we need to deal with wastewater treatment because a lot of our treatment plants are selling out, you know, highly polluted waters. It's not meeting the standards in many, many, many cases, even from the hospitals. Um, so that hopefully we can get some additional attention to the effluent quality standards, which means that the maintenance of these facilities will have to be right up there. So it's not just the, the operators could be well trained, but if the facilities are down, in many areas, if there are machines that are not working, aerators, pumps, blowers, compressors, you know, we can have some serious issues. Um, it's not just COVID. I, I, we, I've been in this industry for quite some time, and the kind of sometimes when I call the Vika to do some testing for us, I, 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 I know what the result will be. You know, it's 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 bad. So that um, we have to find a way to lobby government to deal with this issue. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, of course, yes, we know that a lot of wastewater issues in the Caribbean. Um, I, I, some, I often say among us in the water sector that this is some of the best kept secrets in the Caribbean region. But it is a matter that we have to confront head on. And I think COVID has brought a lot of that to the fore, but we really have to keep pounding it. And um, through the Regional Strategic Action Plan um, that was developed by CWWA and other partners in the region, we are working um, feverishly to try to get it communicated through the, the ministers responsible for water and wastewater have already adopted it but so that it could make its way to the heads of government so they, they can recognize the importance of these areas and, and to be able to put the necessary resources to put it on the front burner for in the whole development agenda. So that's very important you, point you made. Um, I have Christian Simon um, had his hand up. Go ahead, Christian. Hi, good afternoon again. Um, what I would like to agree with the, the previous comment uh, about you know, pushing forward the agenda for government and for especially like the health centers and stuff because what I have tend to, in, to encounter right now is that even though we are in this pandemic, a lot of these health centers and stuff where we have wastewater treatment plants and stuff that they were neglecting for many years and which we have been speaking to them about for several years, you know, we encourage them, you know, hear what they do have to do all the work all at once because they, they keep complaining about budgetary allocations and stuff, you know, you try to work with them. But even more now so that, you know, we in this pandemic, a lot of these organizations are not really taking it still to heart. You know, they, they're still taking it as a, you know, as a lax matter that, you know, that they can allow to handle and continue to think. And it's only now, you know, as they get deeper and deeper, because, you know, we were having a discussion with, um, we were fortunate to meet with one of the ministers, a couple of weeks back, 
why so I sat down, I wanted to step down for 30 years, actually, you're doing a walkthrough again, you know, to check with some of the patients or whatever and stuff, you know. And what it is we were explaining to him is that there are still several sites that are not up to standard and not up to EMA standard. And even though, you know, you may take effluent samples, you show them the test results and stuff, a lot of them are still ignoring it and not paying attention. I know sometimes it falls on deaf ears, even up to now. So this is definitely something that we definitely need to, to push this agenda, you know, and not only for the water, wastewater sector, but also in the water treatment, you know, sector also. All right. Thank you, Christian. Okay. Uh, any other comments, questions that you want to pose at this time? Um, if not, we will thank you very much. And let's just thank our presenter this afternoon, who um, is Devika Ruplal, who has um, given us the, well, being the first of our presenters for this series. And we want to thank her immensely for agreeing to do that and to be the first person to do it for us. So we hope to... Um, run another session sometime next week. Uh, we, we're still sorting out with a presenter. We have had some commitments, but we haven't finalized. So we, as soon as we have that, we're going to send the, the notices out and we will do the house, proper housekeeping to ensure that we don't have that crash that we had today that disrupted the session. I think we were up to about 23 participants at the time and we were down now to about 15. So thank you very much and have a good evening. Yeah.